Yeah, I was going to say, hold your applause. Um, <laughs> thanks for, for having us. I was talking to Ed in the back and saying that um, seven years ago, I've been working at this for seven years. I'm not from dialysis, um, but I've learned a lot along the way. And I never thought something like this would happen. It's really, really cool. I feel incredibly encouraged. So it is a true pleasure to be here. And it's an honor to share a little bit about our experiences. I think Emily this morning gave you financing by the numbers, um, financing what it, what it looks like when it's distilled onto a spreadsheet on a piece of paper. I'm gonna offer some tales from the trenches because we're an example of a company that has um, failed, uh, a company that has succeeded, and a company that's had to spend a lot of time figuring out where the next dollar is coming from. Um, so Altec, really quick about us, we're a Silicon Valley-based technology company. Um, we have been working on a device to lower the cost and complexity of dialysis. We have raised $325 million to date, and I mention that not as a badge of honor. Uh, that is not something that I am proud about. If we could have done it on $20 million, sign me up. Um, I mention it because I, I want everybody in the room to understand the amount of capital that's required. This is a great start, and as you get further and further along, um, your cash requirements grow as well. Now, the good news is not everything takes $325 million. We are admittedly trying to do something very big and very hard, so not, not every innovation is going to require that kind of capital, but I want to give everybody a reality check on what is required if you want to do something that is going to have a major, major impact on service model innovation and on patient care. Um, I'm not going to spend any time really talking about the device, just to say, what have we possibly spent all this money on? Um, the idea behind Tableau, this is the device, the idea behind Tableau was, um, from the beginning, could we make a machine that didn't require any of the conventional water treatment room infrastructure? One, could we make a machine that made dialysate on demand in real time from tap water, again, without any batching, preparation, and any of the infrastructure, and could we make a machine that was so simple, almost anybody could use it. And we did that through software sensors and data. Um, I think what I learned along the way of raising money for this, this guy, um, every investor will tell you, and this is a medical device in general, it's really not unique to outset, um, investors will say, well, medical device, is like it always takes twice as much money and twice as long. Um, and what I wanted to tell you today is that we are the exception to that rule. That's, that's actually not true. That was not our experience because it took five times as long <laughs> and five times as much capital than I ever, at least myself, naively believed when I got involved in, in 2012. Um, I'm going to come back to that, that five times as long, five times as more money in a second. But I actually want to start um, maybe from an unusual place. This was me um, on Easter Sunday at Glide Memorial Church in the Tenderloin in San Francisco. I don't know if anybody's been here. Highly recommended if you like gospel music. Um, so I was sitting at Glide, and um, for an Easter service, it was not particularly religious, which is why I was there. Um, but being Easter, the community activist on the stage, the pulpit, whatever you call it, was talking about the resurrection. And as he was talking about the resurrection, uh, my mind was wandering a little bit, which I'm sure never happens to any of you in a, in a synagogue, a church, this speech. Um, but my mind was wandering a little bit to oddly dialysis because it struck me that we need a resurrection in dialysis. <coughs> and we might be finally on the dawn of a resurrection for dialysis. The, the definition I looked up of a resurrection is an awakening, a revival. And, and so what are, what are we trying to return back to? Well, I've always heard that in the 1970s, 30, 40% of patients were engaged with some sort of self-care, whether that was at home or in the clinic. So we've already proven to ourselves that we can do this. So we need a, a resurrection, a return, a revival back to putting the patient in control, putting the patient at the center of their own care, just as has been done for patients with diabetes as we just heard from our last speaker. So it's possible. So then I started thinking about, well, who do we need for the resurrection? And what is needed for the resurrection? The who can be answered very quickly. Is there anybody else beyond the people in this room who is needed for the resurrection? No. I see physicians. 
I see payers, providers, FDA, CMS, industry, entrepreneurs. We have everything we need in this room, so let's move on. Um, what's required might be a little bit more involved. So I'm gonna make the case that we need three things for their revival, a mindset change, capital flow, and more entrepreneurs. Mindset shift. So I had actually regained focus in the pew, um, and then the, the, the same community activist talked about circumstances in life. He was not talking about dialysis, obviously, but he talked about challenge the, the, the group there. Do your circumstances in life become a destination for you? or do they live as a state for, for you? And I started thinking, again, thinking about dialysis. Like, well, maybe the problem is that the way that we do dialysis today has become a destination. And that word, um, as I put up on the slide there, to me is, when you look it up, it's a, it's a terminus, it's a landing place, it's got a permanence to it. Patients sort of land as a destination from which they rarely, rarely, too rarely escape. So the mindset shift that I propose is a mindset shift from dialysis as a destination to dialysis as a state. Because states are dynamic, states are evolving, um, states are hopeful. So if we thought about dialysis as a state, not a destination, what would it look like? Um, number one, it would look like patients in charge of their own care. They're, they're behind the wheel. Two, it would look like Different, maybe different types of facilities, maybe different types of providers, um, maybe bringing dialysis closer to the patient. A um, lot of, of folks in this room have talked about home support hubs, transitional care programs, smaller footprint, maybe they're in different types of healthcare facilities that they're not today, where the focus is a state change. The focus is a state change, maybe coming right out of the acutes in, from hospital to a state change at home or a state change of self-care and center. They, it would look like an expansion, effectively, of, of where dialysis is provided, when dialysis is provided, how it can be provided, and that is gonna require thinking differently from a regulatory perspective as well, in terms of payment models, new technology add-on payments have been mentioned yesterday, um, tweaks to the CMS conditions of coverage. We, we do need some structural tweaks to, to make this possible and create dialysis as a state, not a destination. Now, it's also gonna take a wee bit of cash. So I am gonna talk about capital flow because the state change is not going to occur without new ideas, and I mean not just new devices, new service model ideas, new apps, new content, and that's what takes capital. So I'll talk a little bit about um, the, the numbers. I'm not gonna spend too much time on this. Emily covered it well. Good news, bad news. Good news, there was $9.8 billion that flowed into um, US healthcare. But, but we didn't even make the slide. I was totally horrified when I saw this. Um, for, this is from Silicon Valley Bank. So it's, it's cardiology, neurology, orthopedics. It's the same cast of characters. And you know, no offense, and they're doing great work. But, but we need to be on this slide. We have to be on the slide. That's the goal. <laughs> Next year. Um, now, the question is, well, what's so hard about raising money? This kind of probably was my naive question. Seven years ago, I raised some money for, for other programs, other devices in cardiology. Um, the part of the question I failed to also ask myself is in nephrology. There's raising money, and then there's raising money in nephrology. That I thankfully was naive about. Um, the, so I'll tell you what's so hard in, in, in a minute, but the next, I have to like take a deep breath because I get PTSD on this next slide. <laughs> Please nobody take any photos, okay? Because it's super embarrassing. Um, I'm gonna show you every single person that turned us down. And it's a lot. And um, I get very nervous because I do not look like the, um, the award-winning CEO salesperson. Uh, 51. Um, and I'll add counting because if we ever have to raise money again, which we probably will, um, I will have to add more names to this list. So we got turned down by mutual funds, hedge funds, um, China funds, Euro funds, sovereign wealth funds, funds in San Francisco, Chicago, New York, LA, Boston. I think there was like a couple people from Virginia too. So everybody turned us down. But I wanted to share this with you because it's the truth. 
Um, and then the more important thing is, well, what needs to change to increase capital flow? Because I see this, and maybe I'm deluding myself, I see this as not a repudiation of outset. I see this as a repudiation of nephrology. I, I think this is a no to nephrology. And that's actually what really pisses me off. Who cares about outset? I mean, we, we need more money in nephrology. This is a big, fat no to the field of nephrology compared to cardiology and neuro and ortho, where we are like swimming in new devices. So, what do we need to do? Have some ideas. One, these are tales from the trenches. One thing I learned is success begets success. And it kind of reminds me, and I put um, this little quote, I don't know if you guys can see it, but it kind of reminds me of how I envision that movies are pitched, um, where the writer comes in and the producer is like, okay, this is gonna be like Finding Nemo meets Avatar meets Driving Miss Daisy, and each one of those movies was individually successful, so therefore, it's success. And I was like, I'm in, um, because one plus one plus one equals three. So, the problem we have in nephrology is we don't have the one plus one plus one. We have one, and let's celebrate that. Next stage was a startup, and then next stage was a small company, and then next stage was a medium company, and then they went public, and then they got bought. That is a huge win. So we need to celebrate that. Um, Emily mentioned Tiva Medical, awesome. In the vascular access space, huge win. But we need one plus one plus one plus one plus one, because the way that, in my experience, the way investors think is one is a fluke, now the good news is two is a trend. So we don't need 20. <laughs> two is a trend, three is fear of missing out. Oh my God, there's been three companies that, and I don't mean about transaction actually, I don't mean about three companies that went public, three companies that got bought. I mean three companies that are have commercial adoption. They have revenue. They have people buying the product. That's what I'm defining as success, to be clear. This is not about a financial exit. It's about building something that helps people. And it can't help people it, unless the providers of the health use it. So, so the success is about seeing it commercially adopted. Um, when we start to do that nephrology, there will be safety in numbers. Because then they can look at this and go, oh, okay, this is Tiva meets next stage. I mean, that doesn't even make sense. But <laughs> something like that. Um, because there's a psychology of, of, of safety when there's been more than one or two successes. What, what I've been asking people to do is kind of a trust me. Yeah, it's never really happened before, but trust me. But it feels, success feels like a black swan event in nephrology. We need success to feel more like routine in nephrology. Because investors, although they portray themselves as, you know, we're leaning in, we're super, super risk averse, we're early, early stage, they really are not. Um, it's all about risk mitigation. And the perceived risk goes down when others have been successful. Okay, enough said on that one. Okay, so the other one is, and this is part of creating success, is we need to create a world in nephrology where new devices are used. And I know that sounds super bizarre, um, but I've never encountered this before in healthcare where new devices come out and they're, they're kind of like not used. And so, so you guys have done a very poor job of developing the device. Your device doesn't add value, fair enough. But, but it, it's a little bit beyond that. Um, one of the, I think the biggest reasons why investors have not invested in nephrology, and certainly again with outset, is um, they need reasons to believe. And, and so they need to believe that you can get through the FDA. Um, and I think in nephrology, that's a check. I mean, we've had a phenomenal, phenomenal experience with the FDA. That's not an issue. Can you get through clinical trials? Check. With enough time and money, yes, you can make it if your device works. Um, and then you get to the, the aftercare, which is the commercial market. And this is where investors are getting stuck. Because again, there's no evidence. Like, show me the evidence that this is a community of early adopters. Show me the evidence that when new devices come out, that they are embraced. And then you get into this fun conversation when you're describing the market. Well, actually, it's kind of a two-party system. And then they look at you and say, well, you got two shots on goal. Well, what if you miss, what if the one shot goes away? Now you're down to one shot on goal for, for a customer that can adopt your therapy in the chronic setting, which is the biggest part of our market. What if you what if you don't get that shot on goal? What if nobody even gives you the ball? What are you gonna do then? Can you actually build a company? Can you generate enough revenue outside of our two-party system? That is a very, very uncomfortable conversation. So we need, the help that we need as a startup community is actually from the providers, whether you're a health system, a hospital, 
a dialysis clinic provider, a new service model innovator, um, is adopting new technologies so that investors can see this is a this is a community of early adopters. It's worth it. They have to believe it's worth it because when you're talking about 10 years and 100 to 400 million dollars, that investor better believe that it's going to be worth it. And worth it is people use the device and you and you generate revenue. So, so that's my recipe for, for how to create capital flow, and, 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 and we can't do it alone. Um, I, I want to talk about one point that's probably mostly for the entrepreneurs in the room, um, which, of course, is the message of, okay, having said all that, please don't give up. <laughs> um, this, what I have been through financing three times now, and I used to wake up in, for some reason, all my no's came on Monday mornings. I think people thought about it over the weekend, they're like, no. Um, but I always used to get all my email notes um, first thing, like 5, 5.30, they're all in New York. And so I remember so vividly, I'd wake up and immediately check my phone, I'm still in bed. And I would see like one, two, three, four no's. And, um, but, I, but to Winston Churchill's point, you know, never, you, you can't lose your enthusiasm. And we never have. Um, so I do define success this way. Because this is the hard part, you know, when you, whether you're developing a device or raising money or trying to get through the clinical trial process, um, it, it is going from failure to failure without a loss of enthusiasm. We have never, ever lost our belief and our enthusiasm that this space would benefit from new technology. And the good news, again, for the entrepreneurs in the room, I want to give you the postscript. Okay, so we can end on a high, end on a positive. Um, here's what happened. So the good news is we found a few. <laughs> and the good news is you don't need 51. You don't actually even need 10. Um, you need a handful of the intrepid. You, you need a handful of true believers when there are not very many reasons to believe. So yes, you know, it worked out for, or it has worked out for, I'm always paranoid, who knows about tomorrow. But so far, you know, it can be done. That's the main message I want the entrepreneurs to take away is it absolutely can be done. It'll just be done faster if we can create success and get the community to adopt and use and buy new technology. That's my advertising part. Um, the last thing that we need are entrepreneurs. I'm the least worried about this, and I'm less worried about it today than I was last week, for, for obvious reasons. Here's why we need more entrepreneurs. More equals more, that's why. Because my experience in trying to raise money was, I'd be 45 minutes into the first conversation before I even talked about outside of Tableau. Investors don't know anything about dialysis. They haven't had to learn about it, because there's been no new devices. And so it's this vicious circle. So I'd spend like 45 minutes talking about everything there is to know about dialysis and the commercial dynamics and then like shoulders are slumping down and you know the pricing dynamics and well it's a bundle payment there's no extra payment for devices and then like shoulders are slumped but uh, but we got this really cool device but if there's more entrepreneurs who, who are approaching investors about their ideas and nephrology then investors will actually have a reason to learn so we can collectively educate the investor base and that's super important i'm not saying people are lazy i'm saying people are busy so they don't have the time to, to learn about a new clinical space and one that's quite complex from a commercial perspective. So the more entrepreneurs equals more education equals more sort of investor interest. And the more people are approaching them, then it starts to be, feel like a hot space. We need to get um, nephrology to feel like a hot space because we want to induce this, this fear of missing out. So the fear of missing out will be more people. Hey, I want to talk to you about X, Y, and Z. Also in commercial <coughs> adoption, the more entrepreneurs with more new devices that are coming to market, we're gonna collectively help create early adopters in the space. And lastly, of course, the more of us talking about upending the status quo, which, which isn't an exclusive process, by the way. It's, to me, an inclusive process, but it does mean change. And the more voices, the more sort of startup and novel voices pushing for change, the better. So I wanna end with um, a return back to, to Clyde and the, the concept of the resurrection. Um, I talked about what do we need? we need? We need ideas, we need capital, we need the will. And I think we, we have that. Um, so I'm gonna end on the who. I, I, I thought about you know, who are we waiting for? Are there better people? Are there, are there, is there like a smart person out there that's not in the room? Probably, are there like prettier people? I don't know. Um, but what are we waiting for? And, um, and I just, I pulled this last quotation I heard a long time ago from the poet June Jordan, um, we are the ones we've been waiting for. It, it will not happen by waiting for others to assist. This is the group that needs to activate, so let's go for it. <laughs>